You know, after going through a large game, seeking all there is to do, and engulfing yourself in the story and characters, all you want to do is finish it strong with a great final battle and ending. That is, until you get to said final boss and realize that the fight before it, or fight earlier in the game, was so good, it makes the final boss suck in comparison. Or that the final boss was so bad or boring that you think of an earlier boss with fonder memories. While said final boss may leave feelings of disappointment, we can still look back on the bosses that were great and did their best to overshadow the true villain that would lie at the end of the game. But then we realize it was the second in command all along and that the true evil was right here. Yeah, and search RPG cliche number 57 here. Rules are pretty simple this time around. The better the earlier boss and the worse the final boss, the higher they rank. Extra points, the closer the boss is to the final boss. We're also trying to rank penultimate bosses over post-game bosses. While we do have a case or two where a super boss overshadows the final, some post-game bosses you can still somewhat count as a true final boss, like Arceus in Legends Arceus. That being said, let's get ready to see some great penultimate bosses and some disappointing final bosses. Wait. It's time to talk about Kingdom Hearts! <coughs> Three, five, eight days! <laughs> I don't think I'm being controversial when I say that Days is one of the weaker games in the series. While the story is uh, decent, the gameplay is incredibly bland and repetitive. I may or may not have done a whole video on how I would fix it. With that said, I am willing to admit that it did some stuff right. Namely, the battle against Xion. Who? Alongside Axel, Xion became Roxas' closest friend throughout the story. Unfortunately for the trio, Xion is nothing more than a vessel created to house Sora's memories and keep him from waking up. Her coming to terms with this and struggling with it is her main arc throughout the game. Finally accepting her purpose, Xion asks Roxas to be the one to take her life. This takes the form of a huge multi-stage boss fight as you fight Xion's armored form across the worlds you've journeyed through. And all of that is merely a warm up to her final form, a battle near the iconic clock tower. And as far as the boss fights go in days, this one's not too bad. While there's still the overinflated HP, Xion's attacks feel fair and you're given enough time to retaliate. All this alongside one of the most underrated tracks in the entire franchise. I don't know how they got this to work on the DS, but I am not complaining. Of course, this isn't the last boss. Afterwards, Roxas vows to single-handedly take down the organization. Riku, needing to save Sora, has no choice but to stand in his way. And remember, this is a fight that's been built up to since the very first game in the series, with the secret movie teasing an absolutely epic confrontation. And it's... okay. The music's decent, if not exclusive to this fight. And Riku is intelligent enough. The only real problem is that the fight really isn't all that challenging. With this in mind, I can't really rank this higher since neither Xion nor Riku's battles are particularly outstanding in either way. The former is held back by excessive forms, while the latter is perfectly competent with no huge flaws. It's not bad, it's just not as emotionally charged as the previous fight. There, I said something nice about days, you happy? As a central hub in Bloodborne, the Hunter's Dream is arguably the safest area in the whole game. You can buy items and upgrade weapons here, and get some friendly advice from Gearman, the first hunter. However, there's a grim reality hanging over this paradise. It's a literal dream brought to life by Gearman and the Moon Presence, one of the Great Ones. However, Gearman is bound to the dream forever, and it weighs heavily on him. However, he's more concerned about the current hunter, that's us, getting out of this dream and finding the peace he's been denied for so long. And the only way to do that is... Decapitation! That. We let him do that. Afterwards, we're sent back into the waking world and everything's right. But if we don't, then get ready to possibly tango with the two beings that brought this whole mess to life. Both Gearman and Moon Presence. 
So yeah, as you can tell, Garmin's an optional boss, if anything, depending on the player's choice. Since a lot of people are likely to reject Garmin's offer, he's technically the final boss of the game. However, the true final boss is Moon Presence, and yet it's a secret final boss, only unlocked by collecting the three umbilical cords. If you think that's overly disturbing, hi, welcome to Bloodborne, don't get whacked by placenta. I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, that, that's the thing, Orphan of Cost. Top 10 DLC bosses. Now, Moon Presence is the one with the tight grip over the dream and Garmin himself. And yet, Garmin is the more interesting of the two. Let's do a quick little comparison, shall we? Garmin has been a constant throughout Bloodborne, the one who gave the player their first goal and sits at the only safe haven of the game. He's not a malicious guy, he's a broken old soul who just wants to set us free. In return, we grant him his freedom. So really, it's a tug of war of no you between two guys who just want to save the other. Weirdly wholesome, if you think about it. And if you do fight him, gosh dang it, his reveal cutscene is one of the best in the franchise, building up to one of the best boss fights in the game and series. Tonight, Gammon joins the hunt. He's been in that wheelchair throughout the whole game, but the minute he stands up, you're as good as dead. He's quick and nimble. When he needs to be. And he ain't giving you any time to catch your breath. And with his scythe, he carries the aura of a grim reaper on the hunt for his latest kill. And the only way you stand even an iota of a chance is to match his pacing and try to match his aggressiveness, or you're just another hunting trophy. Now with Moon Presence, I don't know. It's more interesting, not vague, but there's like no build up to it. Plus, its design is a little generic compared to the other monsters we faced. More like a Dementor who lost its cloak. Just so the folks at home remember, we've had a fetus that used its own placenta as a weapon. Also, we've had a toxic boss that used its own skin as a Snuggie. Where are any of these to the final boss? Adding to it, its health is tiny compared to the others, and its moveset is just basic beastly attacks. Like, if it gets results, great, but it's not really something to brag about. Plus, his biggest move is an AoE attack that sets the player down to 1 HP, but then it just sits there and gives you time to easily pop blood files to heal with no risk, or simply hit it and get your health back while dealing damage. Seriously, its ultimate move hurts it more than you. But hey, you kill the Lovecraftian Skellington, you become the next great one, and Garamin is finally set free, so... Happy ending, I guess? I don't know, it doesn't feel as satisfying when taking out a broken old man feels more exciting than slaying a big bad eldritch deity. So, Wallace, not that he's a bad trainer. I mean, as far as water type bosses go, he's as adequate and challenging as they come. It's just that for how much the Gen 3 games have been building up Steven as the more plot-relevant character, it's so much more enticing to fight him as the champion. So when Wallace gets moved up to champion status in Emerald, and in his place comes an even more foppish fishman, it doesn't feel earned. Okay, first, let's look at why Steven works better. The man appears a fair amount of time in the game to guide you, and has a team that mixes between rock, steel, and ground. There's a lot more variety to Steven's presence and a team that leaves a stronger impact as a champion. It helps that his curious and explorative nature would go on to inspire series greats like Cynthia and Kukui to follow in his footsteps. Wallace, on the other hand, has very little presence in the games. He only starts appearing during the Cave of Origin part of the story and occasionally participates in Pokemon contests. That's unique. While this does make him an interesting gym leader, as a champion, he really sucks. Why does it with celebrities being champions? It just doesn't work as well as they should. Granted, he does have a really sturdy water team with a handful of type and status coverages at hand. He's challenging as a champion should be, but okay, come on. Having a water type boss on top of another water type boss, plus an ice boss whose moveset is half water beforehand, just takes away a lot of the impact Wallace could have had as a trainer of his own flair and caliber. It's really bad that I'm starting to think that IGN was onto something. 
On the bright side, you can still fight Steven and Emerald after you beat the Pokemon League, and his team is just as solid as ever with Skarmory, Metagross, and Cradily being nightmare fuels as always. Still can't shake losing the champion theme that's rightfully his though! Bottom line, if you're gonna make Wallace the champion, give us a good reason to be excited about it! Make him appear more in the game, have a different 8th gym, and maybe give him some kind of dynamic with other characters like Wally or your opposite gender rivals to make the confrontation feel more personal. As he stands, I'm afraid this water sport will continue to stay under Stone Shadow. I already mentioned this in my favorite characters list, but many of you may be shocked to learn that Joker isn't my favorite Batman villain. Why, that's an outrage! An insult! Don't get me wrong, he's a great villain. He's an amazing villain. And in the Arkham series, he's especially great. At least three quarters of the time. He's also the final main boss for three of the four games, Asylum, Origins, and Knight. Of those three, I would say that Knight had the best final Joker fight. It really cements that the clown's time is over, and with him gone, the world can finally heal. And that moment where he pathetically reaches out to Batman is actually kind of heart-wrenching. But as for Asylum and Origins, uh, I really don't like to break my one entry per franchise rule, but I couldn't let this one slide. Joker's the last baddie for both these games, and yet he got overshadowed twice by the preliminary rounds, Poison Ivy and Bane, respectively. I'll give Asylum brief since I already got into detail about my feelings on both fights, but honestly, Poison Ivy's fight was the one I remember the most from that game, partly because it feels perfectly in character for her. She's fighting the bat with a giant plant monster. She's got an army of love-struck brainwashed cops wrapped around her green thumb. It perfectly captures everything about her. Conversely, Joker's fight feels completely wrong. He intentionally bulks himself up to fight Batman even though he never needed or wanted to before, and he got his butt handed to him because he was ready for his close-up, Mr. DeVille. I already said that there was a way that this fight could have worked, like if Joker didn't do this on purpose, but Harley did it to him, which had a greater sense of tragedy to her Arkham City, knowing that she had a hand in killing her beloved Mr. J, but as it stands, no, done work. As for Origins, don't get me wrong, Joker's role in Origins was great, but we just finished two powerhouse games about him, and here he is again, still in the spotlight from the original main conflict of the game. Remember Black Mask, his eight assassins? Remember those guys? Once Joker hijacks the focus, Black Mask is just completely forgotten, and only five of the assassins actually mattered in the main storyline. The other three were just reduced to side missions or... <laughs> okay, I actually don't mind that one. But the semi-final fight against Bane, very nicely done. He's backed the bat into a corner where the Dark Knight may have no choice but to break his own no-killing rule. Not only that, Bane's a tank, but he's a speedy tank. Thankfully, Bats manages to temporarily take him down in a pretty clever way, actually. But that was just round one. In phase two, Bane's made himself so powerful that taking him head on would be suicide. Your only chance is to hide, wait until he wears himself out, and strike before finally tangling him up. Already, this is a major step up from Bane's fight in Asylum. Yeah, he's pretty tough there too, but doesn't feel very special and doesn't do that character that much justice. Whereas here, the stakes feel really high in this brawl. Bane has been a legitimate threat throughout the whole game. He figured out Batman's identity and invaded his home and nearly killed Alfred. Bane earned his title as the man who broke Batman in so many ways here. Beg for mercy, scream my name! Origins reminded us that Bane isn't just a muscle-bound juggernaut. He's a muscle-bound juggernaut who can hold all the cards. And I'm sorry, that's a bit more interesting than Joker just giving another we're not so different speech. Irony is a lovely beast. Joker overshadows everyone in Batman's rogues gallery, and yet these second-to-last boss fights blows those scrapes away. The Metroid Prime Trilogy, the franchise's first big step into the world of 3D gaming, and arguably one of the best. Part of that is thanks to the overarching threat that they've been building up through all three games. Dark 
Samus. Debuting at the end of the first game, she's been a looming presence throughout the trilogy. She's mysterious, cruel, and on par with the original Samus in every sense. Even when she disintegrates in the second game, she just shrugs it off and makes a comeback as the ultimate big bad of Metroid Prime 3. Yet would you believe she's just the penultimate fight? Oh boy, if she's just the opening act, I'm excited to see who our headliner's gonna be. Uh that is a giant alien popsicle. Three games of buildup for a giant alien space popsicle. I can almost taste it. Okay, okay, I should probably explain. This is actually the Aurora Unit 313, an organic supercomputer hijacked by Dark Samus to further her goals of infecting the universe with Phazon and empowering herself even further. After we wipe the floor with Dark Samus, she fuses with the unit in one last ditch effort to swat Samus away. I mean, yeah, it's big and it could summon Samus clones to take a bite of your health, but just look at this thing. One thing the Metroid franchise can boast about is how intricate it can get with its final boss designs. But this, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's a freaking popsicle! How do you expect me to be scared of this when you've just been busy running from this for two and a half games? I'd argue Dark Samus is a bigger threat before fusing with the suit. At least then she could teleport, pack a bunch of things, she could make clones of herself, forcing you to determine which is the real deal. Oh, and the kicker? She didn't feel like a giant stationary target. Between Dark Samus and SAX, the franchise seems to have a knack for devious doppelgangers. So do you really need anything extra? If they turn out like the Aurora unit, probably not. That's just the catch 22, isn't it? I say that Mario and Luigi Partners in Time is the most under talked Mario and Luigi game, and yeah, it's the one I talk about the most. I play Count Shaman for that one. While everyone loves raving about Dark Bowser and Cacletta's soul, it's hard not to be impressed with the battle against the Elder Princess Shroob. You have seen hints that the Cobalt Star you've been collecting throughout the game may not be completely what it seems. When Baby Bowser completes the star and you hear Peach's plea, the entire game changes on its head. The realization that you have been manipulated by this alien queen just through the literal collect the divine MacGuffin storyline that Mario games are known for makes some of Fawful's plans seem rudimentary by comparison. The battle itself pushes the bros to their limits. The Elder Princess does everything she can to kill you, launching herself at you, summoning UFOs to drop bombs, transforming into an Eldritch Abomination even Kirby would do a double take for, and even making her subjects do kamikaze dives to take you out. That last tech alone shows how the Shroobs are beings of pure conquest and destruction. Even the music, which is fantastic, goes into a somber part where even it feels bad for the Shroobs who know nothing but pure destruction. Their bloodlust will make them do anything at this time to kill the bros. My summary of this boss back in Darkest Mario moments did it best. Nothing matters anymore except this fight. It's just our defenders of peace and justice against one of the greatest evils I've ever seen in a video game. Okay, if that's such a great final fight, why is she here? Well, because she isn't technically the final boss of Partners in Time. For some reason, we always have to end a Mario game with a Bowser fight, and that's where we get an Elder Shroob-possessed Bowser or Trouser. Yes, we are talking about and counting Trouser. Look, you go into the battle screen and the credits don't roll until you beat him. He counts. For those that don't know, the Schrauser fight is less a battle and more a dodging minigame. Dodge the attacks he's aiming at you and they will rebound into the Elder Princess Shroob's spirit. Do this enough times and the spirit will be destroyed. Between the lack of actual combat and the music which is more light-hearted in comparison to the somber melody we got before, it's really underwhelming. Seriously, it's really annoying that we had to end the game with that battle when the other games were much better with their finales. It's made worse with just how good the Elder Princess Shroob fight is. It may not be as tense as Cacletta's soul or as epic as Dark Bowser, but it holds itself well as a great middle ground between the two. And the fact that it wasn't the final fight is an utter travesty.
Like most 30-year-old franchises, Mega Man has a handful of spin-offs that deviate from its usual formula. The AUs always seem to have different villains in each installment that gets a fair amount of focus and are usually a big part of the story, rather than being subjected as red herrings to last-minute twist villains like the original and X Games. Speaking of the X Games, Command Mission seems like it's following through with the former at first, being a spin-off to that series and all. At the start of the game, we're introduced to Epsilon, the leader of a rebellion army who leads the revolt against Giga City. Epsilon was the subject of an experiment for an upgrade called the Supra Force Metal. While said Force Metal corrupted other Reploids and made them turn Maverick, Epsilon was undeterred. He's able to utilize the immense power of the Supra Force Metal and wanted to help other Reploids achieve this as well. Of course, this requires him to chase the people off of Giga City so that he can salvage the resources there. Despite this, he's not really a violent guy and wouldn't actively harm bystanders to get his way. Unlike Sigma, who has the same goal but isn't afraid to purge mankind to achieve it. A well-intentioned extremist who doesn't sacrifice innocent people to meet his ends? Oh, now you're really challenging my suspension of disbelief. Eventually, you corner Epsilon in the penultimate chapter, where Scarface then stands up against the Hunters on his behalf. Even after Scarface was defeated though, Epsilon shows no sign of retreating. He'll see to it that no Hunter will slow him down from achieving his goal. Epsilon comes with a slew of powerful attacks, such as Fatal Attack, which has a guaranteed crit, Meta Crush, which drags an ally's health down to one, and tons of vicious area attacks like Nova Impact and Ultra Giga Fire, Blizzard, and Thunder. It's a pretty fun and thrilling fight overall, fitting for such a formidable villain. But wait, we're not in the final chapter, so this isn't the final boss. Well, maybe Epsilon will come back with an upgraded or corrupted form and we'll have an even more climactic rematch with that- Surprise! Ah, son of a, really? Another lame twist villain in a game that doesn't need one? What is with Mega Man and these fuckers? Oh, and if you thought Wily and Sigma were annoying, they are Hitchcock tier compared to Red Ips. Not only is he just another bland power monger, not only do his fights range from obnoxious to stupid easy, not only does getting to him mean going through a boss rush zone infuriating and makes the arc of Yamato seem merciful, but he slaps you with another revelation that completely ruins a former ally character. Yes, I know Redip spelled backwards is Spider, and they did show Spider doing a few sus things throughout the game, but considering he has an established backstory and code of character, seeing him get thrown away for this pointless twist is just dumb. It's just dumb. So yeah, in standard anti-climax fashion, we went from an interesting and surprisingly unique antagonist for the series to what's basically a modern Disney baddie. It's even more insulting when you think we'd finally be free from having Sigma shoved in our faces, only to get something even worse. Just glad the other Mega Man AUs actually have villains that stick with their guns to the end. I'm going to lick ya. I know most of you were expecting this duo to be somewhere on the list as soon as you saw the title. It's probably the most obvious entry on the list. But even so, everyone and their mother who's ever talked about Skyward Sword has said how disappointing Demise is and how Girahim should have been the final boss. That being said, sometimes cliches are cliches for good reason. Girahim just feels like a final boss should, a true test of all the skills you've gained on your adventure. He tests your mastery of Skyward Sword's sword fighting mechanics. He's been a looming presence in the game since the very start. He's the one who kidnapped Zelda. He's the one who set Link on the path to becoming a hero by letting him live. He's the one who commands the forces of darkness throughout the game. He's the one who finally succeeds in his mission and frees Demise. This boy deserves an award for going above and beyond the Call of Duty. Demise, on the other hand, while he's talked about, doesn't really have the presence in the story that Girahim does. And when he finally does show up, he's just a big brute swinging around a sword with an appreciable skill. To the point where you can actually beat him without using the ability to catch lightning with your sword against him. I would know, I did it, because I was too dumb to realize that you could actually catch lightning with the Master Sword. I know Demise is the predecessor of Ganondorf, but does he have to look and play so much like Ganondorf from Twilight Princess? Sure, he doesn't get distracted by a fishing pole, but too bad he still has his crypto net. 
Then again, given how silly weaknesses is a finale staple for the series, maybe Garahim's better off without it. When it comes to villains in the Final Fantasy franchise, the two most iconic are easily Kefka from 6 and Sephiroth from 7. With that said, the other villains do have their fans and rightfully so, one of which being Kuja from 9. Now at first glance, nothing really stands out about Kuja, aside from his, uh, fashion sense. Equal opportunity fan service. Jokes aside, he does his job as a villain pretty decently. He's cunning, manipulative, and always seems to be one step ahead of the party. Though there's still something lacking from him, that little extra ingredient to make him truly memorable. That occurs when he, alongside our heroes, venture into the world of Terra. There they learn that both Kuja and Zidane are artificially created beings known as genomes. The whole reason for their existence was to inflict genocide upon the people of Gaia and transfer their souls to Terra. This realization completely breaks them. But while Zidane's friends are able to convince him that his life is worth living, Kuja ain't so lucky. He's so blindsided by the purpose of his existence and his own mortality that he succumbs to nihilism. In his own words, Oh boy, I'm gonna have to... Um, mortal? I, I'm finished? <laughs> I don't believe you. Why would I believe such a silly story? You're telling me that I'll die soon. Now that I'm more powerful than anyone, I'm gonna... Die? Lose my soul? <laughs> what comedy? Zidane, isn't it hilarious? I'll die just like the black mages I so despise. I single-handedly brought chaos into Gaia. But in the end, I'm nothing but a worthless doll. I won't let it happen. I won't. I won't let this world exist without me! In response, he destroys Terra and sets his sights on Gaia. Naturally, the party has to stop him. As for the battle against him, it's about as grand as you'd expect. In addition to epic music, Trans Kuja himself is a formidable opponent. He has some of the most powerful magic in the game and is smart enough to target characters without reflect. His most dangerous attack by far is Flare Star. It inflicts fixed non-elemental damage to the entire party based on their level. And there's no reflecting it either. Of course, Kuja refuses to accept his loss and wipes out the entire party with Ultima, forcibly ending the battle. But instead of us getting a hype second form to fight against, this happens. Necron, a god of death who has never been mentioned in the entire game, comes out of nowhere and takes Kuja's place as the final boss. Lame, 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 lame! Yep, the guy we've been fighting against for most of the game gets upstaged at the very last second. Now, to be fair, there are arguments made about why Necron makes sense, at least from a thematic standpoint. As I alluded to earlier, a big theme in 9 is despair. <laughs> Something we see both Kuja and our heroes struggle with is their own mortality. All throughout Final Fantasy Danganronpa, we see Zidane, Garnet, and Vivi suffer tragedies yet resolve to live their lives in the face of them. Therefore, Necron, as a god of death, represents the final challenge for them to overcome. The problem is that A, it still comes out of nowhere, and B, it completely steals the spotlight away from Kuja, our main villain, who was doing the whole thing just fine on his own! It's not like it would be difficult to fix either. How about actually alluding to Necron's presence in the storyline? Like, every now and then you get glimpses of some greater force at work. Or maybe when it gets mentioned to Kuja, you see him legitimately afraid. That way, when Necron shows up, it's the culmination of a whole game's worth of foreshadowing. Or better yet, remove him entirely. How could you be so appalled by the fact that the heroes could beat him that he loses the last remnants of his sanity and tries to end all of existence with Ultima? Then have Necron instead be the embodiment of Kuja's despair and nihilism. 
we could still have the fight be the same, just change a bit of the story elements. With all that said, Transkuja and Necron aren't number one since the fight with the latter isn't bad, as long as you don't get too unlucky with Grand Cross, which is far more than I can say for number one. Monaka overshadowing Big Bang Monokuma from Danganronpa Ultra Despair Girls. Would have been nice to have a well-written mastermind as the final baddie instead of freaking Junko again! Osborne overshadowing Ishmael Galog from Trails of Cold Steel 4. Have a major villain built up for six games and he turns out to be not the main villain in the last one. That's always fun. Zephiel overshadowing Adun from Fire Emblem Blinding Blade. The King of Burn is pretty much the only challenging boss left after Roy actually becomes usable. Giant Bowser slash Antasma overshadowing Dreamy Bowser from Dream Team. It's a creative finale, but looking at how grandiose the previous fights were and how this one goes down to like four turns tops, I kind of expect them more. Go on. Guess. Guess what's number one? It's not like this boss became a meme for being one of the most disappointing final bosses of all time. Go on. Guess. Oh, what a surprise. Jasper Bat Jr. has been the butt of so many worse or disappointing boss lists that he should legally change his name to Jasper Butt Jr. Haha, <laughs> wait, no, this is serious. I'm an adult. Wait, this is a Suda 51 game. I might need an adult. Where's Alice? Show me your passion. Release me from this cycle. Free us all in a crimson sea. Right, Suda51 game. Everyone's weird and blood horny. Anyways, there are a couple reasons that these two are here. And it's literally the rules of this list. Alice has a fantastic fight, and Jasper sucks. Alice is a multi-saber duel between two warriors who have nothing left to lose. Alice is a cool-handed fighter who just wants to know how to leave the assassin life, and Travis is a hothead who is moments away from exploding, realizing his crusade for revenge is as pointless as the entire assassin rankings themselves. Their fight combines all the best cliches of samurai movies, character action games, and anime into a single duel that is only beaten by, I don't know, right in an Armstrong maybe. And at the end of the fight, Travis hits his boiling point, releasing all of his frustration onto Sylvia and tears into her about the whole system she runs. If the game ended here, that would have been an amazing ending. It would have easily hit the point they were trying to make home. But the next cutscene happens, Travis sleeps with Sylvia and decides to co-kill Jasper anyways. Q, boring final level and a super frustrating final boss. You know the drill. First phase, Bowser Jr. car, have fun not getting run over. Phase two, fake superhero and it's the worst part. At least we got no more heroes three with our actual good superheroes. And phase three, parade float. How parade float? Why parade float? And on top of that, all these forms are known for having hard to avoid attacks that can stun lock you and eventually kill you if you aren't careful. Ugh, I'm getting a headache just from talking about this guy again. I'm gonna skip the part about what this fight means in the community and the symbolism behind it because there are a ton of video essays about it and none of them matters because it doesn't excuse this boss. Ours was an absolutely fantastic fight and we didn't deserve this BS we got at the end. If there is any gamer boss to leave a bad taste in your mouth, it's this one. Thank Glob No More Heroes 3 was better. I'm the Fiery Joker, and I have a giant urge to finally do a positive boss list again. And it can't all be subtle. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.